everybody. We'll, we'll get started. Logan, do I need to turn the mic on? No, we're good? Okay. All right. So uh, Dr. Jakubowski said he'd be here in, in a few minutes. So I'm going to start and kind of do my review here. Um, Friday, I had a big bandage on my nose and a big bandage on my head and a black eye. The black eye was a basketball elbow. The side of the face was the dermatologist not liking what she saw. So actually, uh, I pulled the Band-Aid off. I got a bunch of stitches here, uh, basal cell cancer, and then one on the nose. So let me ask you, what, what is that? What is the cause of cancer? Inflammation, right? Oxidative stress. And the particular oxidative stress that caused this was sun, too much sun, right? So what are the things could I do to reduce my risk of cancer? It's like a quiz. Sunscreen, wear a hat. Okay, what else? What's what's one type of food that will accelerate cancer cell growth? Sugars, right? So antioxidants and vegetables and be protective. Okay, so that's just like you guys are getting it. It's so far advanced from even a lot of doctors that they'd say, well, just cut it out. No, why did I get this? Okay, excellent. So um, I just, that was my first visual aid. Now, uh, last week, I told you the story about my dad's war experiences. And I told you about this guy, uh, Craig Salvatore, who met my dad for the first time, just randomly hoping to meet one of eight surviving uh, soldiers from the, the war in Okinawa. And his uncle died in Okinawa. And he was just hoping that maybe one of these guys knew his uncle. And my dad was the one that knew his uncle. So back to that idea, is, is there really a higher power that orchestrates any of this? Are there these tender mercies out there? Do I have those in my life? That's what I wanted to kind of say a few things about before we start. So um, Craig obviously was really grateful. He finally met somebody that knew his uncle and knew something about his uncle. And the last, they used to call his uncle sleepy because he could fall asleep anywhere. But he's a really likable guy. He's a fun-loving guy. And he took a bullet right between the eyes, uh, died instantly. So um, my brother said, you didn't tell the other half of his story. The other half of his story was uh, Craig w uh, lived in New Jersey and every day he would uh, take a train uh, a subway to New York City, and he worked in Tower 2 of the Trade Center. On the morning of 9-11, uh, his son was going to free school, and he didn't, he didn't do well the first day, and the second day he was crying, didn't want to go. So he was trying to console his son, and he missed the, the, the train to, to uh, Manhattan. So he, so got the next, next, he got the next train. And then there was about 10 minutes minute delay on the tracks. train. And then as he what, he got off the train, he thought, you know, I got this extra ticket here to take the ferry across the Hudson River. It's a beautiful day. I think I'll just take the ferry across. So usually he would sit on the side of the ferry that looked at Manhattan. But this day, everything was, uh, all the seats were taken. So he took the other side, was looking at the Statue of Liberty. And he got about halfway across and they heard this big bang. And everybody said, what was that? And somebody said, well, a little plane just flew into the Trade Center. And there's, there's, oh, my, oh my gosh, gosh, that's, that's terrible. terrible. So, so um, he, he, he got, got off the ferry and, and started walking to work, and he, he got, got a half a block to the trade, trade center, center, and he, he looked, looked up, and there was a second, second plane in the building. His, 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 his work, work was on floors 9, 90 through 96. So he saw this, and his first instinct was, I got to get in and help, because he's a helping kind of a guy. But then he realized, what is it I'll be able to do? So he turned around and he said it instantly when he saw that plane go in that airliner, he said, oh, my gosh, Bin Laden did this. Now, he said the only reason he thought Bin Laden, because Sunday night he had watched on 60 Minutes a report about um, a someone who was in Bin Laden's circle who was actually an American spy. And when Bin Laden found out who he was, he had, he, had him executed. So that's the only connection he knew with Bin Laden. And then two days later, he sees this happen. So he, he immediately got out. He, he found a, uh, a lady who had been on the subway with him for many weeks. And he said, I know you. She was a young girl. I'll get you home. And so they, they, got, um, they got back on the last one of the last ferries that go back the other direction because it was just a pandemonium. And uh, then he got on a train. And when he's on the train, he heard that the, the Tower 2 had collapsed, the South Tower. 
and that was his tower. Um, so he said he lost about 100 employees. There was a, a lady that he knew that was in college getting her degree, and he was also uh, working on a degree. And so they would kind of encourage each other, hey, get your homework assignment in. How are you doing on that paper? Well, she, she died in the, in the collapse of the building. So he, being the nice guy he was, he made sure that she got her degree posthumously. And at first they were like, no, she didn't finish her assignment. She, she can't, we can't give her a degree. Finally, they decided to award her the degree with the rest of her class at the formal graduation ceremony. And he arranged for that to happen. And so her, her husband family is really appreciative that they could honor this woman for her efforts. Um, his boss was on, in the south part of the tower on the 90th floor when the first airplane hit and he said you could feel the heat, you could feel the heat on his back. And uh, what they didn't know is on the west side of the building, there was a, um, the, the east side of the building had, was, was really damaged. There was no way to get down the stairwell, but there was a stairwell on the west side of the, the building that nobody even knew about. So had he been in it, he wouldn't have even known it was an escape route. But a, a lot of the people um, got out. In fact, his boss, when that first building, that first plane hit, he immediately went down, got out of the building. And because he lived through the, the bombing in 93 at the World Trade Center, I think that's where it was. Um, and um, so he knew there was a potential problem. And uh, he was, uh, I don't know, a couple blocks away when the building collapsed, his boss was. So, so again, this is uh, another example. And there's, we know all these stories of people that should have been there that day. But I thought this was kind of a cool uh, story about, uh, you know, this experience that Craig had. And I put all these pictures in here to kind of bring back the memory. So I talked to him today. I said, tell me the story. So it's pretty amazing. So I want to tell you another story. This is my oldest daughter, Kristen, with her four girls and my son-in-law, Mike. Um, Eden is the oldest daughter. And uh, they were actually living in, in, in Connecticut, uh, about an hour from Manhattan for several years. So we visit there often. And uh, Kristen got pregnant for the second child. And at the, I think it was the 12-week ultrasound, they said, there's a problem with your baby. Um, we're going to confirm this, but it doesn't look like she has a brain. She has anencephaly. Um, so if you would like to abort this child, we can arrange for that. And she said, no. God gave me this little baby. I'm going to keep her as long as I have her. So she delivered uh, 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 Ellie. At, whoops. Yeah, here's Ellie. And uh, Ellie, with her cap on, she looked like a normal baby. Uh, but without her cap, you could definitely see she had a little uh, look like a snowman on top of her head, which was a collection of blood vessels that would easily bleed. So they had to have plastic surgery. But Ellie lived for 40 days. Uh, here's here's Eden and Ellie and my daughter. And there's Eden and her sister. Um, and then this was uh, uh, this was the funeral. They're saying goodbye to Ellie. And then this was uh, at her grave site. And this was Eden. This, whoops, sorry. I'm a little behind. This was Eden a few years with her next sister, um, Emery. And then let me show you this one. Uh, this is kind of a, of a neat little video that my daughter, um, let's see if I can get this to play. I don't know if this is gonna play or not. My daughter made this in memory of Ellie.
So um, when Ellie passed away, she was she was they sent her home uh, about a week before she died with hospice, and Kristen was holding her when she died. They didn't have any idea how long she would live. A couple of weeks, a couple of years, didn't know. And uh, they all had to, Mike especially, my son-in-law, you know, he's an athlete, he's into sports. He was hoping for a boy. Now he's got a girl and it's like a boy. What if, what if she lives for 10 years like this? Can I take care of her? And so they both had to get to the point of accepting God's will and just we'll we'll do, do whatever. whatever to this little girl. Girl. And yeah, when she passed away, we, we, we were, I was at home with some of my other kids and my parents, parents house, and she, she FaceTimed us and she said, said, Ellie just passed. We're not going to mourn. We're going to celebrate her life. And uh, she, she set, set the stage, stage to make it easier for all of us. But, but here's, here's the, the cool part, part of the story. story. Um, she, she called, called the, the nurses, nurses at the hospital, hospital that, where she had spent, spent three, three or four weeks, weeks of her life, life and then uh, in NICU. And, and so, so one of the nurses, nurses walked down, down to the room that she had spent most of her life in, looked out the window, and there was a double rainbow. Now, what nobody knew at the time was that... Kristen had just conceived for the next little girl um, like a week or two before. So this was a double rainbow. And I, I looked up what that meant. So um, it symbolizes the transformation of life. The first rainbow represents the descent from heaven to earth. The second rainbow represents ascending from earth to heaven. Pretty amazing when you think of that, right? It's kind of like if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, I'm there to comfort you and to let you know that I know what's happening in your life. So I just think um, we need to be looking for that, those reassurances. Okay, so that's uh, my inspirational piece for the day. How long ago? Uh, six years, I think. Yeah, five or six years ago. So uh, this is uh, was about strength, and fitness, and back pain management. We're going to actually. When Dr. Jacobowski talks, I'm, we're going to illustrate all of this because this is a real, this is like the take home slide. This is not about, it's not, my goal is not to say you all have to get really strong and buff and, you know, look really lean and like you belong on a stage at a bodybuilding contest. But it is important that you have strength in your muscles, that you balance your joints so that you can move better and get up and down and you don't have neck pain and shoulder pain and these other problems. Uh, this is a little bit of information about the average uh, rate of muscle loss. Um, so nearly 25% of anyone over 65 years old are affected by this change of loss of muscle. And uh, so, uh, 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 of 60% of those over 80 are affected by it significantly. That's when they really start to decline. Here's some of the reasons why you lose muscle. So we're going to talk about... Um, we talk about hormones next week and they're all hormones have, but then there's some other reasons. And probably the biggest one here is just not using them, just being inactive. This was just an article that I shared that said, uh, this was a study done in nursing home patients that even the elderly patient in uh, elderly people can get stronger. Your body will respond to training. And then here's a, a couple of people who seem to have defied the odds for the aging process. And the woman on the left here, she didn't get into fitness till she was 43. And so at this time she's 64. And Ernestine Shepherd didn't start training, she was 56. And look at her at 81. Uh, Dr. Life, I, I know him at one of the conferences I went to and you know he kind of told the story. He was 57 on the left here, just gone through a, an ugly divorce. He's an internal medicine doctor in Pennsylvania and uh, was drinking heavily and not coping well. And he decided it was time to take charge of his health. So this change here in Dr. Life is pretty remarkable. Okay, this is, these are just some of the reasons why you all need to be thinking about ways to get your muscles strong and toned. Okay, so how do you develop it? Well, this is what I talked about, but you can't, you won't get stronger. Your muscles won't respond if you just pick up a weight and you're just, just doing this and, okay, five minutes are up. I'll do the other one. I mean, you've got to get to the point where when you get to the 10th or 11th or 12th, you can't move it anymore. You're struggling to really move that. You want your muscles to be sore. You've got to find a way to make the muscles sore. 
Okay, so there's the three different muscle groups, the upper body, which pushes and pulls, the core muscles, with, which bends, twists, or twists and extends backward, and then the lower body, basically the muscles that help you stand up and propel yourself forward. Those are the keys there. Now, I don't know if this was on the video. Does anybody remember this on the video? Okay, so I won't review um, uh, Dr. S uh, or Mr. S Sato. But uh, this is really cool stuff. Uh, this is good science behind this, that when you restrict blood flow, you do a lot of good things to help the body heal. So if you partially restrict the flow by um, 40 to 60 percent of the arterial flow, and you do a lot of repetitions, um, you'll build up a lot of um, lactic acid in your muscles, and that stimulates a bunch of responses, which are really good. Okay, so brain-derived uh, neurotropin factor, that's brain fertilizer, helps you think more clearly, increases your muscle growth. By stopping this, this hormone that's called myostatin, which keeps your muscles from getting way out of control. If you didn't have myostatin and you were lifting weights, the muscles would get, just would not stop growing. So you have to have something to kind of hold that back. Well, this kind of blocks that to a degree so the muscles do get bigger, so you look more like uh, Jeff Life when you train. Uh, to increase your muscle stem cells by 300%, uh, that also helps uh, injured, healed muscles. So that's why they were using this in, um, in soldiers who were, had limb-threatening injuries. It helped them get their muscles uh, strong again. Here's a great one. Lifting weights increases vascular endothelial growth factor. You've got heart disease. You want this. You want this growth factor. This tells your heart, let's, let's branch out and make some little tiny blood vessels around that blockage that you have. Um, or any other, I, you know, I got, you know, this incision here. I had arteries were blocked. How do I get blood flow back to those areas where the arteries have been cut? By vascular endothelial growth factor. I will restore blood flow to that area that's been cut out because of this growth factor. And then they said it increases nitric oxide production. That's pretty cool. Guys who lift weights really hard will sometimes tell me I have a more firm erection the night that I've done a hard uh, exercise in, with weights because you make more nitric oxide, more blood flow. Okay, so um, so you never know. You never know where you'll be. When I was, uh, I remember when I was about. 21, I was thinking, man, I really miss pole vaulting, but I don't, I don't have access to a pit. I don't know if I can do it. And then it, I was 50 and I was down watching my son pole vault. And I thought, maybe I can try that again. I started doing it. So I just found for the next 10 years that there's something I could look forward to. Uh, Dr. Jakubowski, we, we lift weights and this is a, a really good core exercise. I saw this done. I thought, I won't be able to do that, but I can do it. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I was telling my, uh, my nephew, Dylan, once that, you know, when I, was, when I was your age, Dylan, I could get down on, on my hands and kind of balance myself with my knees on my elbows and pop up into a handstand. I was telling him about that. It was at my daughter's reception picnic. And, and as I showed him that, I did it. <laughs> and it wasn't like randomly. I'd been working hard with weights, but I, I was like, holy cow, I'm 57. I can do that. So now, whenever I'm on a beach, I try to stand on my hands. And that's not easy. Uh, and then I, I love playing basketball. Not that I play it well, but, you know, I, I wondered if I'd be able to play with the, the guys that I play with. And then when I was in, in uh, college, I did this. I used to do this sort of trick on the high bar. Let me see if I can show you. This was me a couple years ago down at the Quaker Stadium. trying to flip myself up, right? I couldn't quite do it. All right, so I thought, all right, I gotta spend more time in the weight room. So I spent a little bit more time in the weight room. Not that it's all that great of a move. You know, a gymnast would say, this is nothing. But I wasn't able to do it, and I didn't know that I could do it again. There, there's nothing now that, that I won't try. If I'd done it when I was younger, uh, it's, it's, I'll continue to try doing it now. Um, this was just the day after I 
I've been training for this. I thought, I'm going to know how many of these I can do. So I'm just, you know, just doing chin-ups. And you'll see as, as we get closer to the end, and I'm struggling, but it didn't matter. Uh, you know, it's 59, when, that was two or three years ago, doing these chin-ups. And um, I, want to, I want to do more than that. It doesn't matter that I'm getting older. I think I can do more. I want, I want to do 20 really good ones. Those probably aren't kind of the quality that I want to do. So everybody's like grunting with me now, right? <laughs> um, and then this is, the, this is kind of the, the, uh, the other funny thing is uh, when I was younger, I used, my dad was a really good diver. He would entertain, put on these diving shows. And I was never as good as he was. But I took a diving class in college. And I, you know, I would do some things off the high diving board. But I hadn't done anything in like 25 years. And I thought, man, my, my oldest granddaughter, Eden, who I showed you, she said, Grandpa, I want you to come to the pool. And I want to show you how I can jump off the high. This is two months before I went out there to see her. And I thought, I'm going to do a one and a half off the high and show her that. And I thought, boy, that's, I thought, okay, I'll do it. And then when I was there at the pool, I was scared to death. Nobody knew I was going to do it. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's really high up there. And my balance, I'm not sure my balance is the same. Hadn't done it in 25 years and I almost talked myself out of it. But I said, don't, don't, don't act too old to do this. It's only water. You can't hurt yourself. Right? So <laughs> Wasn't really true, but here, let me show you. Now I have, I have, uh, I am very humble about this. <laughs> now the kids all thought I hurt myself. Um, I, I was thinking, oh, this is feels really good, and then a whack, the water hit me, <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm fine. And and they were all laughing, and I thought, man, my neck's hurting, my back's hurting, but I wouldn't let them show. <laughs> But I'm glad that they recorded that because I know exactly what I have to do next time. <laughs> the next time I go, I'm not going to lean as far forward. I'm going to jump up higher, not be afraid of the board, and I'll do it. And I'll make sure that uh, if I do it again, I'll show you. <laughs> now, this is, uh, this is the, kind of the, you know, 30 years down the road. This isn't me. This is Dr. William Bell. His son, Earl, was a silver medalist in pole vault. And they actually have a pole vaulting camp down someplace. I think it's in Missouri. And if you know Kayla Caldwell, she's a local girl from Indian Valley. She was she was training there, trying to get make it through the Olympic trials to be on the Olympic team. But this is William Bell at the age of 90. OK, let me show you what a 90 year old is doing. Since none of you are 90 yet, you got time to do something like this. <laughs> so, you know, just decide what you want to do and start working. And, you know, by the time you're 90, you'll probably have the world record for whatever that is, right? All I have to do is 7 3 when I'm 90, and I will beat that record. All right. So we talked about when you violate these principles, you pay a price. And I talked about my back pain issues. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on that because I want Dr. J to, to talk about this. Uh, but it has to do with this being weak, this being weak, this being tight, and this is tight. And so when he comes up, we'll kind of illustrate that. So um, I, th I think uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate this, Mike. Okay. So we're just going to skip so you can. Oh, L let me demonstrate why this is so good. Because most of us, when we sit, our hip flexors get really tight and they don't want to bend back like this. When a lot of you do this, you would lean forward. That's not really stretching the hip flexor. That's stretching your body straight up and down. But when you go up, you're strengthening your gluteal muscles. So this has to be stretched. This has to be strengthened. It's a great exercise to do that. And, and since Dr. Jacobowski is here and he did this well, I'll show you what this looks like. 
See how the toe is, the knee is not in front of the toe when he goes down. He's stretching the hip flexor really well. That's, that's really good. So good stretch here and it strengthens gluteal muscles. You don't have to use dumbbells. You can go with free weight, but it's a really good exercise for my back. When my back is hurting, that usually takes the pressure off of it, especially if my butt cheeks are sore the next couple days. It tightens, the, it tightens up, so I stand more like this and not like that. So that really makes a difference. All right, so Mike, I'll let you take over here with some of these pictures, and then I'll, I'll help you with the demonstrations. Okay. Do you want me to advance the slides? Do you want to do it? Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if you want me to do talk you want about to go, all of them. Yeah, I was going to say just run through some important ones to get an okay. idea of it. Okay. Okay. All right, how's everybody doing? Good. I'm Dr. J or Mike Jakomowski. I'm down at uh, Twin City Chiropractic down in Denison. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, know much about me, but I grew up in the in the city of Cleveland and uh, well, east of Cleveland. But uh, when I got my first opportunity to, to work as a chiropractor was down in Denison. Uh, which was a huge change for me because um, it used to have a stoplight and now that's gone too. So a uh, big difference for me, but I, I love it. And I've been here, I think it's been 17 years now. I kind of lost count. Um, but anyway, uh, meeting Dr. McKnight gave me a chance to talk about uh, the spine, back pain, arthritis, uh, nerve pain. We've all experienced some of these things and what's arthritis? Uh, how do we get arthritis? Who gets it? And we all get it. And we'll talk about some of those things. I'm going to run through some of the slides because I think the most important thing is talk to you about uh, exercising and stuff you can do at home uh, that will be best, uh, best for you. So uh, obviously we have the spine and then we have the curves, the neck, cervical, mid-back, thoracic, and the lumbar curve. Um, and that acts like a spring to take cushion or act like a cushion or a spring. So when we have our spinal joints, the discs that are in between each bone, um, it just acts like a cushion and keeps stress off of it, okay? And then uh, what we see a lot of times happen is we have bad posture develop. We sit at computers all day. We sit at, uh, at a desk. We're hunched forward. We're leaning forward looking at the screen. Or we work in a factory and we're just hunched over a machine all day. Well, what we see happen is we see something called a forward head posture. So we get this, this mid-back rolled forward. And what we know through time and, and gravity of all this, we see that it just puts a lot of stress on our neck, and as your head moves forward, for every inch, it gains 10 pounds of weight that your body has to compensate to keep your head up on the horizon. So with that, we start to develop this thing, what we may have seen in people is called a hyperkyphotic posture, where you see these rounded backs and people are kind of hunched forward a little bit. And when we see that happen, we can see that we do that at our desk a lot or at a machine we're working at. If you go to the next slide, Dr. McDoing. Um, and how do we know if we have this hyperkyphotic posture? One thing you can do at home is just lay flat on the floor on your back. And if you find you're looking at the wall behind you and not looking at the ceiling, you probably have some of that hyperkyphotic posture. And I just want to do a little uh, demonstration with you guys. I want everybody right now to hunch forward like they're at a desk just looking at a computer. Right now. And then I want everybody to take a deep breath in for me. Okay. All right, now I want everybody to sit up nice and straight, shoulders back like you should be sitting. And now I want you to take a deep breath in for me again. You can see how much easier it is, right? So through science and studying and, and doing tons of studies, they found the mortality rates higher in people that have this hyperkyphotic posture. It's not only the, the, the uh, posture that causes problems, aches and pains and nerve problems, but you're not getting as much oxygen in your body. Okay, we see people get less oxygen, so that affects everything. You know, if you're not getting less oxygen, your body's physiological function, hormone function, is not at its optimal level. So you can see how important it is for aches and pains posture, but uh, just for your hormones throughout your body. Okay, next slide. And when we see the stress, and this is a disc, this is that cushion that's in between your bones, if you go to the next one. Um, we see disc herniations develop with bad posture too, or repetitive strain. 
So what we know about the disc, okay, and if you guys could see, it's like a jelly donut, right? We have the jelly in the center, and then we have these rings of tissue that keep it held center there for us. And what we know about joints is they feed off of motion. They have poor blood supply to them. So when they're not moving well, um, they're not getting all the nutrients they need, okay? So when they're moving, fluids rush in, feeds the tissue, keeps it healthy. But when it's not moving and inflammation builds, we start to see damage happen to these to this disc tissue. And when damage happens to these outer rings, it becomes weak and this jelly in the center starts to migrate out, okay? And then the, the rings of tissue eventually tear. Uh, so when we see that happen, we see disc radiations. How many people in this room have a disc radiation or bulge? Yeah, MRI show it, yep. So how do, we, how do we develop these things? It's just movement, repetitive strain. When we have aches and pains, we don't do anything about it. Um, and through Fit for Life, what we know is metabolic syndromes, trans fats, the things we eat. If you go to that next slide, I'll say some of that. Um, these create inflammations in our, in, in our joints, and we know inflammation breaks down cartilage tissue. So our goal not only is to keep stress off our joints, is make sure we eat healthy so our disc tissue doesn't break down and then cause more uh, disc herniations and nerve impingements. So one time I was at the airport and my, my luggage came across down on the carousel and I, it was a big heavy suitcase. And I bent and I twisted, bad, bad posture for the back. Bent and twisted, reached for the bag, threw it off like that, and my back was pretty sore. So what I did, I'm sure I tore some of those those fibers on that disc. If I keep doing that and I keep tearing it enough, it goes from this to this to this, and then all I need to do is is reach down and pick up a pencil the wrong way, and it'll it's enough to blow the disc out. So these repetitive dumb things that we do, lifting a TV out of the trunk of the car, or lifting a bag of you know groceries out of the car and twisting and turning at the same time, over time it's just one little injury, and now we've got a disc herniation. And that's what we see most in practice is uh, people say, I just bent to grab or tie my shoes or grab a pencil off the floor and then my back went out. Now I can't stand up. So it's not that one incident that caused it. It's everything adds up, adds up, and then the last straw breaks. And then we see some of these disc issues develop from it. Um, and, and what we see happen is if we don't keep stress off of it, if we don't promote motion into the joint, now, when we look at these two pictures, again, this is the spine and this is the disc. And we can see on this side, it's nice and healthy, right? Everybody in this room is going to develop arthritis. There's no way around it. It's going to get us off. It's just how bad it develops in us. Um, and when we have an ache or pain and you're like, boy, I'm not going to turn my head to the left because when I do, it hurts. So I'm just not going to do it. Well, your body's reaction to that is it wants that range of motion because fluid rushes in. Again, it feeds the cartilage tissue. This is not only for our spine, but our shoulders and everything. So if you don't move it, your body's like, okay, I'm not getting all the nutrients I need. The cartilage tissue will break down, okay? So it thins out, and then you see it. It's, it's, your body's goal is like, okay, this is wasted material. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of calcium at it. I'm gonna harden it, and it turns that soft tissue into bone. Okay, and that's arthritis. So we've heard of stenosis. We've heard of degenerative disc disease. We've heard of all those terms, and basically those are fancy terms for arthritis. And now when you go to turn your head to the left and you're like, okay, I wanna do something about it now. It's been years, and you go to get some help, and you're like, man, I, it's not gonna go that way anymore. Well, it's bone now, and once you lose it, you won't get it back, and that's the importance of keep moving, is keep that tissue healthy, Keep movement in there so your body doesn't just turn it into bone. Um, Do you see why in the old days when you threw your back out, the doctor would say, just lay on the couch or mm -hmm. put you in a, a, a brace and don't do anything? How that was the worst advice, right? Yeah, so you got to keep moving. So if you have pain when you turn to the left, we got to figure out why and maybe go to somebody to figure out, okay, how can I improve on this? And so not only our diet deteriorates these joints, which we talked about, but we also should th be thinking about extra supplements or nutrients that we should be taking. So if people heard of glucosamine, right? That's a nutrient that your disc or cartilage tissue feeds out throughout your whole body. So that's a good supplement or, or vitamin to take every day, okay? If you can take it. Um, and just natural anti-inflammatories. So 
what we talked about is these tears, right? Builds inflammation. And when that happens, we start to see aches and pains show up. And what we see typically when we see these X's on the body here, we see two syndromes that are very common in people. One's called the upper cross syndrome here, and one's called the lower cross syndrome. So if we demonstrate on you a little bit here, we run out of time. Okay, we got plenty. Um, so if we look at upper cross syndrome first, and this is everybody that sits at a desk who's um, pulling a lever all day at, uh, at a factory, um, is just we get stuck where we kind of see our shoulders roll. And if you look at Dr. McKnight here, he has big traps, right? They're strong. I, I hate to admit it, but he has them, okay? We're gonna point out other stuff that's bad about him, so don't worry about that. <laughs> so we see these big traps he has here. So they're strong. And the reason why this happens here is because you can also see how his shoulders are rolled, right? They're rolled forward a little bit. Yeah. So when that happens, he has that forward head posture because he sits at a, a, a computer all day or he's working on patients. So your body's reaction is, okay, I got to keep his head on the horizon. So I'm going to use these big muscles of his trap to kind of keep his head up. All right. So we see these get really tight. What also happens is there's core muscles in your neck. So we've heard of core for our stomach, right? The abs. Well, we have those in our neck too. So they're deep against our spine. So when these are overworked, okay, the deep muscles of our neck become weak, our core muscles. So they're like the abs of our neck. So then it doesn't help support it. So then he has to use other muscles here in the back of his head, in the front of his neck to keep his head up. All right. Demonstrate that, how they're weak. Yes. Okay. And then what also we see is his pecs become tight because they're short. So you're like this all day. You're at a computer. These muscles become tight. These muscles have to overwork to keep your head up. The muscles at the back of your head have to work. And then all the muscles, the core, the, the stomach muscles of your neck are weak. So one way we test for these things in patients is what we'll do, again, um, is we're going to tilt his chin right into his neck here and just keep my hand right here just hands length off the floor and then I'm going to let him hold it up. Now what we see in people that have weak muscles, core muscles of their neck, they'll start to shake really bad. <laughs> yep. Or they'll be like this, they'll start where I had my hand right here, they'll start to slowly incorporate those other muscles and you'll see them bring their head up like this because they got to use all those other muscles that kind of keep their neck stable. And that's pretty sore, just holding it up right there. Yeah. It hurts pretty good. So this is an exercise actually for your core muscles of your neck, your abs of your neck. So basically what you do is you'll lay just not even a half an inch off the ground. You'll tuck your chin into your neck and then hold for about three seconds and you could rest it and then you would do it again. Okay. So that's part of that upper cross. I want to have you do one more thing. So lay back down, please. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So what we see is when the pecs become really tight, also, we can, when we see this upper cross, it leads into shoulder problems. So maybe someone in this room has had a rotator cuff tear, or they go to wash their hair, and they're like, man, my arm kills me every time I go to wash my hair, or I reach for something. We see that, too, because when your pecs are tight, and then all these neck muscles are tight. When you go to use your muscles, they're not working properly. You got all these tough, tight muscles that res resist you. So this is a good for upper cross, and almost everybody has this. So this is a great exercise, dude. This is called a, a wall angel or a floor angel. So one way we test for this is we know the pecs are tight. Is we want his hands right here, and his elbows, and the back of his hands should be touching the floor. So you see how his hand's bent here? It should be flat yeah, like that. It hurts. So when I just push his back of his hand, it, it hurts. His, his hurts body his doesn't want to do it. Yeah. So now when you're here, basically we're stretching the pec muscles that are tight all the time. But now, because it's trapped so tight here, we want to build low to mid trap, right? So we're going to have him, like a snow angel, we're going to have him squeeze his elbows right into the side without lifting his arms or elbows up as far as he can go and squeeze. And you think, boy, that's an easy exercise, but he's struggling. Yeah, yeah. it hurts actually. Yeah. 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 It's about as far as I can go. Then it yeah. goes up. 
So yeah. show him how you do it. Yep. Because he likes to show off. <laughs> so the floor is the easiest way to do it. Eventually, you do something called a wall angel where you really got to push back. So again, you'll have your knees bent, and then you'll come here like so. I show people this all day, so I have an advantage here. But and then keeping your hands flat and your elbows in, you'll just want to come here, bring it all the way through, and then, and mine's starting to hurt now, and I'm starting to cramp, and squeeze, okay? Hold for about three to five seconds, and then come back up. So if I come down, and my hands are coming up here, this is as far as I want to go, okay? Then you start over, and then as you go, your muscles will start to stretch, and then once you can squeeze in, squeeze in, just don't make it hurt to where you're pushing through the pain too much, and then squeeze and hold, and then come back up. And sets uh, 12 to 15, like you guys do with everything else. That's the basic um, best exercise for the upper cross, okay? Um, and it benefits everybody. So if you have a rotator cuff problem, that might be very hard to do. Um, so again, it would just be here. If you can't get your arms above your head, you'll just want to lay flat to stretch out your pec, okay? Do the neck strengthening exercise. Um, and then we just got to work our way through it to get better. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I'm going to say about back pain, um, you go get an MRI and somebody says, oh, you got a herniated disc and you think, okay, just need a surgeon to cut that out and fix it. And then they'll say, well, it's, I'm not sure this is going to help your pain. You got a 50% chance of being better. And you think, why? You, I, muscles in your back that can cause the pain and you can have little tears in the in the uh, the ring of the uh, disc that can cause a lot of pain so we can fix the problem you got three other places where you can hurt that's why they'll tell you that so that's why the things we're talking about is how you can get out of pain I just sent somebody to see him who the surgeon said I'm not going to fix you you got to go to pain management and she's like just tell me some things I can do and she's got a lot of things she can do. There's exercises we're showing you, and she can see Dr. Jakubowski to get the joints moving. Um, I, 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 I was bending over too much one day with a um, chainsaw, and my back stiffened up so tight when I got out of bed the next morning, I, it was like a knife. I, my knees buckled, I crawled up and down the stairs literally. What happened is this joint, it just, it just locked up. And when I went to see him, he put electrical stimulation on that and about Five minutes later, it just popped, and it, it just unstuck, and the pain went away, and then the other one came later. But that's, that's again, that's immobility. You have to keep those joints moving. You have to be flexible enough to reach down and touch your toes and ideally get down further. But it's all, I just want you to understand why people have back pain, and they won't always fix it. Yeah, and, and again, the key is, is, is movement, right? If, if we're moving, we're keeping inflammation out of the disc, right? That's why arthritis is is we wake up in the morning, you're like, man, I'm so stiff and it aches. But as you move throughout the day, you're like, okay, I feel better. That movement pushed inflammation out and nutrients into the tissue. And that's why it helped. And then you sit for an hour or two watching TV and then you go to get up, you're like, oh man, I can't move. And then you get to bed and you're like, oh, I can move. And then you lay down and then it starts all over. Tell them what you, what, when you talk about inhibition, tell them what you think about yeah. the, uh, like the, uh, the, the mini traps and stuff. Yeah, so the way the disc gets its nutrients and why we see that spring, like the, the curves of the spine, is uh, something called imbibition. So it's a pumping motion. So every time you move, there's a pumping motion. The, the disc opens and closes, and it, it, it pushes inflammation out and uh, nutrients into it. So like a trampoline. Those are great exercise uh, ways of of creating imbibition. A mini tramp. A mini tramp. Yeah, not, not, not ones you do flips on. But, uh, uh, but yeah, that will create an imbibition to kind of kind of get nutrients in there. Uh, imbibition, like when, uh, if, has anybody been on an inversion table where they kind of, you hang upside down? What that's doing is opening up the joint tissue and, 
and allowing nutrients to rush in, so it's very good for you. Uh, there's another exercise called a cat camel stretch, which I think is in your exercise, but this is a way of creating inhibition too for all the joints of your spine. This is really simple. Um, it, as long as you can get on your knees here, but you tuck your chin, okay, and arch your back like a cat's angry here, and then back to your feet, okay, hold, back up, and then opposite, here, and then again. And right, right about there, you'll start to feel that stretch. You really, mm -hmm. the key is to look down as far as you can to stretch all these muscles. So if you really look down, you stretch all those muscles, and about halfway down, you really feel that pull in the neck. So that's basically a, a yoga move. Um, so that's a great way of creating imbibition. Now, if you can't get on your knees, um, you. For one way you can do it for your lower back is called a pelvic tilt, where you kind of, you're arching your back and then you flatten your back and bring your butt up just a little. And then up, and then here. And very simple back safe exercises that will kind of allow you to create that nutrients flowing and inflammation out of your, out of your disc tissue. Those, so those are simple exercises you really should do daily. And what we see happen though, is when we stop using um, our muscles and nerves because uh, we have aches and pains and we don't wanna do it because it hurts, we also start to see we lose something called proprioception. And proprioception is basically a fancy term for balance. Now I'm gonna do another exercise with you guys. So if you guys stand up for me. Okay, so they do studies on this all the time. So. Again, what I'm gonna have you do, and I just want you to count how long you can stand on one foot before you gotta put your other foot down, okay? Before you even touch anything, so try not to even hold on. So if you go ahead and start, okay? See how long you can keep that balance before you put that other foot down. So they did another, they did a study on this, and they found, you know, people that have balance on one leg that can't, are unable to do it, 2.1, twice as much times they have a risk of an injury or fall, and here are the normals, okay? So when you do this type of thing, right, you have all your nerves, you're stimulating them through your hips, you're stimulating all your muscles, you're stimulating all your joints, and you're stimulating your nervous system, because this is what we see happen, is as you get older, they're like, okay, they're losing their balance. I, my grandmother fell, broke her hip, and now she's in the hospital because she doesn't have any balance anymore. And exercise and proprioception is one of the easiest things that we can do to stimulate our nerves to keep them healthy. So when you're brushing your teeth, right, you can stand on one leg and brush your teeth. And you'll see <laughs> the fastest results with this, I promise you. So if you can only do it for five seconds now, I guarantee in a week you'll double the time easily. You do it for two weeks, you'll triple it, okay? And that's what we see with these exercise balls. So one more before I make you sit is, uh, and you might want to stand there a wall, just be careful, is you're going to stand on one leg here. Okay, now I want you to close your eyes. All right, so you're taking vision out of it. You're taking, you, you know, all those other parts of your nervous system that help you stimulate the muscle groups and joint tissue. So this is really important because my dad fell one night walking backwards to bed, and it was dark. He took 10% of his balance out of the picture because he couldn't see. It was dark, right? So he's relying 70% of your balance comes in the bottom of your feet, just being able to detect where you're standing. And then 20% comes from the balance mechanisms in your ear. So his, his balance here was already bad. This was not great. And he took that out and he fell and crashed and hit the nightstand and broke 11 ribs. Okay. Yeah. So five firemen to get him out of bed the next morning. So, um, this is really important because this, like you said, it responds really quick to challenging it. So, you know, you, you stand like this and you're brushing your teeth, you're reaching for the cup, turn on the faucet, get the, get the uh, toothbrush, you do all that. And that will improve your balance. You, even when you're older, if, if I have somebody that's prone to falling, I send them to therapy for balance therapy and they do all that. It makes a huge difference. What I do in the morning, instead of putting my socks on when I'm sitting down on my bed, is I, I put them on like this. I lift up. And I, I force myself to balance like that. And um, that's just my daily balance routine because I don't want to get that way when I get older. And, and we can lose it quickly, right? If we don't use it, we lose it. 
Um, so grab a seat, but that's what these exercise balls are for too. You see these, and you're like, why do I got exercise on these things? Well, this is promoting proprioception. So if you're not standing on one leg, but you exercise and sit and watch TV and bounce on this, or you're doing curls with weights or pushing or pulling, uh, you have to balance on this thing the whole time. So you're creating proprioception in your spine, proprioception exercises, balancing on one leg, using the ball, are all great ways of building core muscles. All right, and those are their stomach muscles. So we're stimulating all these small muscle groups that are along our spine and our stomach and creating stability that way. So like when uh, we work out in the gym, uh, Dr. McKnight's brother and us, we do even chest press. We'll do, um, and this is one of the hardest exercises we do. We use lighter weight and we're here and we're just balancing on the ball and then we'll do weights and we just push up like this. But you got you can't fall over. So you got to use all your core to stabilize you while you do it. Um, and these are simple. So you can easily come here and roll down and then back up. Okay, you're working your abs, you're working your legs you're building proprioception too. You can curl on here. Uh, you can do squats on a, on a wall here that are real safe for you. You can put your back against this and your feet out in front of you and then just squat, sit. You don't have to go all the way down, just a little motion. But again, you have to balance so you don't kind of tumble into the wall like that. Um, and these are great ways, if you have aches and pains, to just exercise on these. Um, um, without causing a lot of problems. One thing for imbibition and opening up the spine too, these are great for it. And we do this all the time as a good stretch is just laying across the ball and, and stretching like this and just laying and hugging it. And I can feel that stretch my lower back now. Something really simple you can do, create that imbibition to feed the tissue and then just roll back up. Okay, you can even do this where you hold it and come forward and just do slight motions like that with it. And you can find these anywhere, you know? You just, for your height, there's just different size balls that you would buy. And they come in 55, 65, and 75 centimeters. So what they found with people that do core type proprioceptive exercises is, uh, uh, let's see, the people that don't do it, 84% reoccurrence in low back pain. Okay, the people that do these type of exercise, they have a 30% reoccurrence of, of the pain, all right? So that's the importance of doing these type of core type exercises. All right, and what we do, what happens when we live in pain too is this. Um, chronic low back pain ages the brains 10 to 20 times faster than normal. All right, they, MRI did studies on these people and chronic back pain patients lose about five to 11% of gray matter a year. Normal aging is 0.5%, and uh, that's about the same as 10 to 20 years of aging. Gray matter is responsible for memory and information processing. So just don't live in pain. And one thing we try to do is, is find out the mechanics of it. So when we're pulling a lever all day, or we're clicking a mouse all day, or we're sitting at a computer just looking at a screen, you're using the same muscles day in and day out. So if you think about it, you go to a gym and just lift one bicep curl all day, every day for eight hours, you're gonna hurt, right? And we see tissue breakdown, okay? When we have injury and overuse, tissue injury forms, we have adhesion or scar tissue form. And like Dr. McKnight said, when we have adhesion and scar tissue form, poor blood supply gets there and blood supply is important to muscle growth. But when that happens and we don't have blood supply, the muscle become weak and tight to compensate, then we, our body does a great job of altering everything so we don't notice it at first. So you hurt something, um, your body will hide it from you, alter its mechanics until it can't take it anymore. And then once that tissue overloads, it's just gonna cause pain and we have this chronic cycle. So the goal is, is to find out and how to break this cycle, if that makes sense. And Dr. J is being really humble about this because not many chiropractors train to, to break these adhesions. This is called active release treatment or therapy? Active, uh, active release yeah, treatment? yeah, treatment. Okay, and he's trained to do this. Most chiropractors don't. So uh, three months ago, he's playing basketball 
and I felt something rip right here in my foot. I'm like, oh no. I, I was hopping that night. I thought I'm going to be out for six weeks. Uh, this is this is bad. And a week later, I went to see him, and he could feel the scar tissue and the, the tightness in there, and he, he broke those adhesions up. I was able to play two days later. It was not a fun thing to go through with how he broke it up. He, he has this evil laugh when he fixes it. <laughs> <laughs> but I could not have played without having the, the, that scar tissue torn out or broken up so it restored the motion. It was just amazing to me. So what we see happen is if we go back to the upper and lower cross syndrome, we can see this altered tissue function uh, develop with adhesions and everything. So if we have Dr. McKnight step forward again. So what we see happen in, in lower cross syndrome is these muscles become really tight because they're overused. So your back muscles. So a lot of people think I have back pain. My back muscles are weak. But most of the time what happens is when you sit all day, you have altered function or lower cross syndrome, you're sitting on your butt all day, right? So he sits on his butt all day, so he has weak butt muscles. So his butt's really weak. Well, my hip flexors, <laughs> my hip flexors are tight. Yeah, so his hip flexors are tight. I'm like this. I'm like, I can't stand like that. That's embarrassing. So I do this. And I'm fighting this all the time yeah. with these muscles here to hold. So when he sits on these all day, they become weak. When he's flexed forward, the muscles in the front become tighter. So these muscles become tight because he has to compensate for it, right? And then we know the cross syndrome is these are weak, these are weak here, this is tight, and the muscles in the front are tight, okay? So again, that's that altered tissue function. So when that develops, we know he has to work these muscles here to make them stronger so it can take stress off of this. All right, we know he has to work his core muscles so the muscles in the front don't become as tight either. And this is most people that sit all day. They have this actually, lower cross syndrome. I, the last 10 years when I would do Fit for Life, by the end of the lecture, I was bending down like this to stretch this back because it was so sore and achy. And I'm not doing that now because I am doing a, a more of the gluteal exercises and the the hip flexor stretches. So it definitely has helped. So I'm not in the pain that I used to be. So the lunge is a great way of doing that. We showed that video of us doing it. And basically what you're doing is you're stretching your hip flexor in the front, okay? You're building your glutes. You're keeping your back nice and straight where it's not having being compromised. And that's a great way of uh, kind of building that strength there and kind of fixing this. Even if you can't go all the way down to your knees? Yes, okay. so yeah. I mean, because some people have knee issues, so, but yeah, even this little bit, just that little movement okay. will help. what Coach Harshall said, just start where you are. Just start someplace and try to gradually improve. Another one, too, to build the glutes back up is, is just a simple bridge, and you don't need a ball for this, but you can do it on the floor, is here, and then you just, you make your stomach muscles tight, and you squeeze your butt, and then just come up like that. So it's knee safe, right? So you're building your glutes. You're building your legs without compromising the pressure on your knees too. So this is, and you can do this on the ball, again, building proprioception and then just coming up, holding for a few seconds, squeezing, and then back down, and then up again. So what we see most problem in, in most back pain, it's not weak back muscles, but it's weak glute muscles and core muscles that are causing it. So these are some of the simple things that we do. Um, uh, at the office specifically, this is huge, is how many people work at a computer at a desk and it's turned to the left or right and they're not looking straight at it. And they have tons of neck pain and headaches. Um, we just want that monitor straight level with us, the keyboard so you're not reaching for it or the mouse and a good chair to sit on could be a huge difference for you. So if you're at a workstation at work, you guys have to fix this. If you sit on your, your feet, um, you know, if you're looking at your monitor left or right, if you're reaching and bending or twisting at the same time, we talked about that. Um, so when you're we got to correct it. Never do this. You always follow your toes. That way you're just bending and not twisting. Bending and twisting is terrible for your back. Okay, if we go to the next one too. Yeah, so that's there. And then something simple like getting in and out of the car, right? We just hop in. But really what we should be doing is sitting and then bringing both legs over at the same time. You know, especially if we work somewhere where we're in out of a car, you know, 20 times a day, that adds that bending and twisting. When we're lifting, you get home from work and you're like, I'm so tired. 
you know, you fall asleep on the couch and you go to bed and you can barely move because you're cramped up on the couch. Um, but uh, those type of things. And then this is again that upper cross syndrome that we kind of went through in class. That. There's the cat and there's the cat camel. Okay, so that's uh, that's it. Anybody have questions? I have a question. You talked about cartilage. Where does the cartilage go from your small joints and knees? Where what happens to that cartilage? So same thing like your spine. If it's not used or wear and tear, um, again, that'll turn into bone also. So it calcifies. Um, and that's when we see people needing knee replacements or shoulder replacements, hip replacements, you know, those type of things. Um, and, and again, we, we can't stop arthritis or those things completely from doing it. We can just slow the progression. The ways we slow progression is exercise, uh, nutrition, eating right, and then supplementing vitamins to kind of keep that but healthy. But arthritis on an x-ray doesn't always mean you're going to have pain. Right. right. Mm -hmm. you can, it's, even a herniated disc on an MRI doesn't mean it's going to hurt. So in a way, it doesn't matter what they see on the images. It's how you feel. They, you they did a study and they uh, MRI, you know, so many people, 60% of the people that have no pain, low back pain or neck pain, have a bulging or herniated disc. When it becomes inflamed and irritated, starts irritating nerves, and the same thing with arthritis. People that don't have pain, we can x-ray them and see some arthritis. We're like, well, I don't have pain. Well, let's keep it that way. Keep moving, keep staying healthy, and then that may never show up with a bunch of inflammation irritating the nerves. Yes, ma'am. Um, a long time ago, when I was very pregnant, um, my second son, I had so much back pain, and my doctor was telling me to do like the cat camel thing. Well, what he did, he told me to get down, you know, on my knees, my hands, you know, and um, and uh, then he was being silly. He said, "Now, he said, lift your back leg and fork." Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, a long time ago, also, um, I had the sciatica thing going on. Oh, that's so painful. I mean, that's worse than childbirth. And oh my, and I had to end up getting shots in my back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes we see that where inflammation is so bad or the disc is so uh, herniated or bulging and it's hard to get under control. And I do think that's a great way to break down um, inflammation issue that's kind of stuck in the joint tissue like that. It is a great way of getting fast improvement. However, it's one of those things that, okay, I feel better. That was great. Um, I have no more pain, and then we do nothing about it. Um, and we just wait till it wears off, and then we get the next, next injection. Because we know the side effects of those steroid injections are it makes the joint tissue weaker, it makes the bone weaker around it. Um, and then through time, those type of side effects lead to more issues, and then the injection doesn't help as much, and then surgery is our last hope. So if we are getting injections and it makes it feel better, is also have some type of treatment or exercise that kind of maintains it that way. Any other questions? If you guys have any other personal questions when we're done with class, you can come up to me and I'll answer them. And I have cards in the back if you want one. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Great.